Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Uh, I am one of your co-hosts, Jim Resky, and I'm joined with my other co-host, Greg Bryan. Greg, how are you doing tonight? Doing great, Jim. That's great. That's great, because tonight, Greg, is uh, one of my favorite uh, types of podcasts that we do. It's the debrief. It's the chance we get to go back and revisit the talks we've given and that we've already posted as podcasts on the channel and for us to talk about those talks. The after talk. The talk the after, after the talk. The, the, the talk, talk you wish you would have given. Oh, yes. In your heart of hearts, the talk you wish you had given. So there's it's a, a talk, for... There's the talk you prepare. Yep. There's the talk you deliver. And then yep. there's the talk you wish you would have delivered. And now with a podcast, we get to do all three. That's the beauty. So uh, we've already posted the, uh, the the prep talks and then the actual talks that we've given. So uh, now we get to do to uh, talk about them and make amends for all our all our sins. So so Greg, you gave a talk on Psalm one nineteen, and so I want to we'll talk about that a little bit, and then uh, I give it gave a talk on Ecclesiastes, and we'll do that uh, we'll do that next. Yeah. So my assignment was to speak on Psalms one hundred seven to one hundred fifty, which is book five of the Psalms. That's right. And if that wasn't bad enough. Um, I mean, that's a lot, a lot of uh, material to cover. So right. what I chose to do is I gave a little brief overview of those Psalms. Um, but I focused most of my time on Psalm 119, because it's like the longest Psalm in the Bible. It was well, the longest chapter in the Bible. And it's uh, an amazing amazing um psalm because um i mean it's just the way it's written um i, I believe it's 176 verses mm -hmm. it covers the 22 letters of the hebrew alphabet every letter has eight verses and every of those eight verses starts with that particular letter of that of the hebrew alphabet so it was almost like a a teaching a tool um, for young kids to to learn the scriptures and the whole psalm is based on the scriptures there's only a few verses that don't really even mention god's word yeah so i call it a kaleidoscope to the glory and greatness of god's word yeah yeah i think and you brought that out so no you were when you were prepping was it hard to just zero in on Psalm 119? Were there other Psalms you say, you know, I wish I'd spend a little more time on something? Because you did bring up a couple other Psalms before you zeroed in on Psalm 119. Yeah, I mean, I love Psalm 139. Like, mm -hmm. that's like, I mean, we I could have spent the whole hour just on one, Psalm 139. You know, uh, at one point in my life, I memorized that whole Psalm. Did you really? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, Lord, you've searched me and you know me, you know, when I sit and when I rise. Um, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You're familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. Anyway, I'll spare you the... So that one was very tempting to... Uh, I mean, I was I was kind of sad um, not to cover it. But yeah. um, there were two um, big kind of regrets, you know, um, things that I wish I would have done um that I, if i could go back and reteach it uh, i would i would do differently oh yeah yeah and um the first one is i wish i would have brought out this point with psalm 119 um if you look at the ver first verse of psalm 119 and the last verse of psalm 119 there's a very fascinating thing you can you can pick up Verse one of Psalm 119, blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. So he's talking about someone whose ways are blameless. Right. 
and someone who walks according to the law of the Lord, which is something we all want to do as followers right. of Christ. We want to we want to be those people. But the question is, can we ever really be blameless? And the answer kind of comes at the very last verse of Psalm 119. And I wish I would have made this connection and brought this out. The last verse of Psalm 119 is kind of a strange one. It says, I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. And so it's almost like he answers the question of, of verse 1 in his last verse, that we cannot be blameless. It's a, the only way we can be blameless is through Christ. And um, so I just... I just thought that was kind of fascinating. I wish I would have noticed those bookends, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, and kind of brought that point out. Did that come up in your Q&A though? I thought I remember did someone it else did co- It did come up in the, it did come up in the Q&A and that's when I thought like, oh, yeah. It's a great point. I see that. <laughs> I wish I thought of that. <laughs> yeah, I w- yeah, kind of like I wish I would have thought of it and I wish I would have brought it out because a lot of times when we read the scriptures, especially like in the Psalms and Proverbs, it always talks about a righteous person or right. um, a wise person versus a fool or a righteous right. person versus an unrighteous person. Um, and I love what Tim Keller says about this. He's like, you know, a righteous person is somebody who disadvantages themselves for the benefit of others. Yeah. Wow. And we're, yeah. We're, we're an unrighteous person. Or an unwise person or a fool is somebody who disadvantages others for their own benefit. Yeah. And when you think about that, and so you can actually tie in like a blameless person would probably be somebody like that too, um, kind of fits in that same kind of category. And so there's nobody that is blameless. Right. Because we're all we're all sinners. And it's just kind of fascinating because it, 176 verses about the importance of God's word. And the last verse is saying, I've strayed from your commands. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that yeah. was one of my big regrets, Jim. Um, as I I wish I would have, I wish I would have found that um and uh made made it because it really just shows kind of what our podcast is all about, right? That um the gospel changes everything. Right. The gospel is the key to everything. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and it's very consistent with scripture. I mean, that whole perspective, there's no one who does good and sin if not, no, not one. Right? So you're right. Those verses about being blameless. Blessed is the blameless. Blessed are the righteous. If you don't get the gospel, you read those and say, oh, great. What hope is there for me? You know? Yeah. I, or, I guess- or, or you think that you you think you are that person. Well, that's right. I got a lot to like, be proud like of. Like a lot of yeah. times we, when we read the scriptures, whenever it comes across a righteous person or a wise person or mm-hmm. a blameless person, we automatically put ourselves like, well, that must be me because I love God. Right, right, right. So I must, you know, and if you if you don't get the gospel, then, then that's totally pride. That's totally spiritual right. pride. But if you get the gospel, you realize that you're only righteous, you're only wise, you're only blameless because of what Christ did, his sacrifice on the cross, his substitutionary atonement. Right. Um, we have his righteousness, his blamelessness. Right. Yeah, his yes. wisdom. In fact, in fact, when God looks at us, if he says we're blameless, it's not at all because of our record. It's his record that God is looking at. That's what substitutionary atonement means, right? So, But I thought you did bring up the last verse, didn't you? Is it just that you missed the connection with the first verse, the way to put them together? Is that because I thought I remember you yeah. saying, you talked about, you know, that I've gone astray like a lost sheep, seek your servant. So I thought. Yeah, yeah I think I, I think you're right. It's just that I, it's one of those things where I wish I could have. It's so poignant. It's yeah. so perfect, right? The symmetry I, of it. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, the symmetry of it. Yeah, I. Um, it, right. It's one of those things, and and we have this experience when you when you when you teach a lot. Sometimes your best ideas come during your teaching. <laughs> well, that's a tough <laughs> one because it, then you're like, oh, is it, it's really if it comes in your thought while you're your head while you're doing it, like, is that a rabbit hole I should go down? Is it a 
is it good? And it might sound brilliant in your head, but as soon as you say it, you realize, no, I'm just going on a rabbit hole. Now there's no resolution to this at all. And I should have not, I should have the mental discipline to not bring that up, you know? So, but sometimes, uh, you know, uh, I think, especially if you're teaching the word, maybe that's the Holy Spirit leading you to say, go down this other avenue. Um, but usually I think in, in when I'm teaching my, my, uh, it's too easy for me to go down rabbit holes and bring in stray thoughts that would just have no, and just become distractions. They have no resolution whatsoever. So, right. but I you know what you're saying. It's like, as soon as someone says that, you're like, ah, yeah, that's right. Exactly. The first verse, the last verse tied together. Wish I'd said that. So anything else you regret? Anything else you'd look at, Megan, that I wish, wish I could be more clear on something or said well, something? I know you weren't, I know you weren't there for this talk, but one of the things I said is because some of the other guys, when they do their presentations, they have these amazing pictures. Like they find these really obscure Bible passages and they find, they find these amazing paintings of the, so one of the things I said in my talk is I said, you know, whenever I search Google for an image of like man carrying the ark stumbles, I come across pictures like, you know, that, that, that one that you see on the screen, Jim. Well, now it's an audio only podcast. podcast. Now that you brought it up, right here, you're going to have to describe it for our listeners. How, how would you yeah, describe it's it? A, it's, it's a guy that's in a museum and is, and he's kind of knocking over a very super expensive vase with, with his behind and the vase is on its way to being destroyed. And it's probably priceless, you know, or right. if I search Balaam's donkey, I get something like this. Which is, which is an elephant, an elephant that is like got its trunk laying on top of somebody's car, and the people in the car are like looking at the elephant and wondering if they're going to survive. Or if I search "road to Emmaus," I get your favorite picture, right? Which is <laughs> these two guys dressed up as clouds, and they're walking around a corner, but they don't know it. But there's a guy walking on from the other corner, and he's got this. Uh, He's got all these like pastries on this car. No, they're pies. That's the whole. That's the whole joke. There's a big rack full of pies. Clowns and pies. Full of pies. And the 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 beauty of the photograph is you're catching the moment when they're both on opposite sides of the of a corner. They don't see each other and they're about to collide. It's just the, it's the yeah. imminent collision that makes this the with the clowns and the pies. Yeah. It, it's like a know. disaster right waiting to happen. That's right. Exactly. And, so, uh, all our listeners, it, I wish you could see it. So, yeah, and it and it's and the faces on the clowns are hilarious. Did there. you get a good? I, so I wasn't there in purpose, person. I listened to it later. I listened to the audio. I heard laughter. Did you get a good laugh on that? Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was some. There was some good laughter. And I was in that one. That one actually, I had at the beginning of my presentation, but I, I realized it wasn't going to fit there, so I just kind of like, I I waited for the right time, which was during some of the Q and A. So yeah, that was. Maybe that was something that went well, but it was just more like comic relief. The the other thing that I wish I would have spent more time on is the um the thought about Jesus in Psalm 119. Um oh. the ways that we see Jesus in Psalm 119, you know, and just like the whole idea, like you know, Psalm 119 is all about the word. God's right. word and how right. John chapter one says the word became flesh. You know, you did that. I remember you, you, you brought in I, did, I didn't talk word. about it, but it, I, it was at the end. Yeah. And it's one of those things. I, I don't know. I just wish I kind of wish um, I wish I felt like I was rushed mm. and I didn't spend enough time fleshing it uh, like um, fleshing it out. Fleshing it out. The right. word became flesh. That's right. Um, but I thought I also thought I could I could have brought that in, yeah, much earlier. And so it felt like, and we all again, you know, when when you do a teaching, uh when you teach like we're like we're doing with, with this Bible study, and especially covering such big portions of scripture, you always have to have more material than you need. Cause you don't want to run out of material, but then there's always, so there's always material that you have that you sometimes feel like, ah, oh, I wish I could have given that more time. So I, I was looking at my, looking at the clock and I realized, man, I didn't have, so I, I, I flew through it. Um, 
but I wish I would have spent more time on that. Well, for the sake of our listeners, if any of them are you know, uh, leaders or teachers or um, preachers, it's one thing if you're preaching a sermon. We're not preaching a sermon where you have you know, a time, a target, 25 minutes or, or even 45 minutes with no interruption. At the end, you just say, let us pray. It's a Bible study. Now, there's like 100 guys who come and 20 or, 20 or 30 on Zoom and lots of commentary, lots of questions, but it's really an open forum. So the timing of it is one of the larger challenges, right? You want to make sure you have plenty of time for people to make contributions. And I think you did. You did. But I remember there was a lot of Q&A on the recording afterwards. So people had a lot to say about it. And, not, and um, so I think I think you left ample time. And I, I didn't, it, when you, and I want to tell you, when you spoke, it was two minutes into it. And I, I don't, I hope the listeners felt this way. I'm sure they did. I, you, were, you were two minutes into it. I said, man, Greg is on. Greg is just nailing. I thought I thought your your voice was clear. It was authoritative. I felt you know, you were talking about. You felt like you had. I, it felt to me as a listener because I wasn't there in person. I'm just listening to the recording. The way a lot of our podcast listeners are going to listen to it, like this guy's got a command of the material. He's confident about what he wants to say, and he's going through it at a, the right, just the right pace. I I really liked it, Greg. I thought. Um, uh, I, I, I thought it was just a, just a great talk and the, and the presentation of it just as a just a pure rhetorical speaking matter I thought just came off really well. Wow. Well, thank you for that. I I appreciate it and I I can only thank the Lord for that because as you know you and sometimes you and I will call each other the night before. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Almost every time actually. <laughs> and and usually usually we're both like. Oh, this is the worst. <laughs> throwing slides out, putting slides in. That's right. Changes. That's right. It's going to be a disaster, Greg. I just know it tomorrow. It's, 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 it's off. So we're, we're wondering whether or not we're going to sleep at all that night. I mean, so I, That's man, right. I, I feel for pastors that preach every week. I mean, I can't imagine um, the pressure it's, that they they go through. Um, yeah, it was fun. Uh, last thing I'll say is, did you like my two stories about Psalm one nineteen? Well, Matthew Henry. Is that the, the one, the guy who uh, put off his execution long enough to get the. Um, no, he, that's he, George, George Weishart. George Weishart was a bishop of Edinburgh in the 17th century. Right. And uh, he was another guy with the same name, con- right? He was condemned to death because of his faith. Right. But when he was when he was on the scaffold, he made use of a custom that allowed the condemned person to choose one psalm to be sung. <laughs> He chose the longest. Who, one yeah, I can't believe he was the first one to do that. Everyone would choose Psalm 119. You would right? think so. You would think you so. Would think and, everybody would choose Psalm 119. And before two thirds of that psalm had been sung, his pardon arrived and his life was spared. So Psalm 119 literally saved his life. And the tradition ended that that day. <laughs> they said, the, "Yeah, the next guys, so oh no, every, <laughs> you can quote every psalm except with Psalm 119." That's right. <laughs> there are limits. That's right. Last guy did that. No way. Well, and then Matthew Henry, who wrote the uh, commentary of the whole Bible, a classic, classic Bible commentary that you can find online for free. He was introduced by by Psalm 119 by his father, Philip Henry, who challenged his children to to take one verse of Psalm 119 every morning and meditate on it. And so you would go through the whole Psalm 119 twice a year. Yeah. And um his dad said to do this because this will this will help you fall in love with the scriptures, with all the scriptures. And, you know, so the th- thinking is that that definitely made an impact on Matthew Henry's life, so much so that he dedicated so much of his time to, to do a commentary on every verse of the Bible. Awesome. Um, so, um, yeah, I love those two stories. But the, the one about the uh, that is just nuts. Um, that this, that one guy, I couldn't imagine singing the psalm. He must have known a a pardon's on its way. And if I could just stall a little longer. um, Right. 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 So, uh, and then there were people like Blaise Pascal, uh, William Wilberforce, David Livingstone, who memorized, who who have have memorized all of Psalm 119. Boy, that's a, that's pretty cool. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that. So now, hey, I do have a question for you, though. Okay. You brought up Psalm one fifty one, and the whole idea that it was it's there and it's but it's not canon. And I, I to be honest, I I got to be honest with you, I had never heard of Psalm one fifty one before. 
And so I remember you uh, reading it and talking about it. It's like a story about David. Um, and then you said it's not canon. Did you do you learn, like, understand like why is it not canon or why did people say it's not? Um, it sounded like, and I had maybe some of the listeners or maybe the Q&A, I can't remember now if it came out too, but people, other people seem familiar with it, but I'd never heard of well, someone before. So, um, you find Psalm 151, and we call it Psalm 151 because it's a psalm really that doesn't have a number, right. but it, it's it's in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's written by David and it's, it refers to the story of David and Goliath. It's kind of like a, yeah, his memory of slaying Goliath. Right. Um, no, I remember you read it and I remember hearing it like, Oh, and, um, but and, so it, in traditional Judaism considers it part of the Apocrypha. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, they just, I, it, no, it was never voted to be official part of the biblical canon. And I, and I, I don't, I think it's, if you read it, it really doesn't fit with the Psalms because it doesn't even read like, like Psalm 23 or right. um, it's, it, it almost fits better like in Chronicles or um, in, you know, Kings. Um, it, it's interesting. It's probably for sure was written by David and, but there's nothing, there's nothing anti-biblical that that is in it so it's like um so i'm kind of glad um it didn't make the cut yeah yeah um, that's interesting because there are plenty of other places in other books where people break into song like in judges i think deborah when she wins a battle with Barak, she goes into a long song in the book of judges and so but that happens all over the old testament so it could easily David talking about how he had, you know, killed Goliath could have easily been at another place in the Old Testament scriptures. But you're right. When you yeah. read it, that doesn't sound like well, the Psalms are more like I'm pouring out my heart to God and and, um, you know, emotionally connecting with God. That's what makes this usually what makes a Psalm so great. Yeah. So I think somebody found it. I don't know if Ezra, you know, I like the idea that Ezra is the one who compiled all the Psalms and put them together. Oh. Oh, um, I like okay. that kind of thing. And I also like the idea that Ezra might have written Psalm 119. Yeah. Because of how devoted he was to to knowing God's word and to teaching it. If he was if he was devoted to teaching it, Psalm 119 is written to be taught to to children. Jim, you just recently taught on the book of Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, although we won't really cover Song of Solomon that much, but um and i loved it i loved your presentation oh thanks craig it was fantastic i mean um very well organized um but let's just dive in with that do you, what were some of the things that you changes you would make if you were to teach it again well there's a, a bunch of little things so i think um I just I don't know where to start. Uh, just in just in terms of a speaking exercise, because we touched on this a moment ago, talking about your presentation of the Psalms in Psalm one nineteen. When you have a time uh, slot, and we in our we have an hour and fifteen minutes, um, I used to kind of plan, you know, like an hour's and fifteen minutes worth of material. And well, that doesn't work because the people want to contribute, and there's a lot of interaction in the study, and. Um, not this one, but the one before I said, I'm going to plan about 45 minutes, 50 minutes worth of material. There's plenty of time. And so that for me took, takes a lot of stress off uh, the timing of it, because uh, there's always uh, we, the, one of the, the biggest stressor is not so much covering the material. It's like, how do I time this out? And I say, I'm just going to, I'm going to time less. And, and, and what happened this time, I, I had about 50 minutes of speaking and then any questions. And then we had uh, about 20 minutes of, of conversation about it. And people really had lots of thoughts on it, which was, I really like. So if part of that is if I feel like if there's no conversation, people are like, Oh, that's nice. I got to go. And then you're not touching anyone. Right. So the fact that it spurs thoughts, I think helps you feel like it's reaching people. And, uh, but then when I say five minutes, the end for song of songs, and that was, and that's all I really want to say about song of songs. So that, 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 that timing part, 
was good. But to do that, then you end up a lot of things end up on the cutting room floor. And so some of the things we talked about, uh, like in the in the pre podcast, we were talking about that. So like when I was talking about the three different ways of living: achievement based life, cause based life, uh, pleasure based life. And I mentioned cause based is DC, and then um, uh, achievement based is New York. Uh, in the pre-podcast, I had some stories about New York and New York's history. And I, I, you know, there's just no time to bring those out. So just cut those out. And there's a bunch of little details like that. Like if, if I, if I said, you know, you got two and a half hours to do this. Oh, okay, great. I got all kinds of, and then you, you, you just you lay it, put it all out there and I can keep cutting, 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 cutting to get it down now. And I think that I like this pattern now, do like 45 to 55 minutes. And then look at people that are up to you after you say two words. And I got to, your hand goes up. Okay, like, no problem, sweat. We can talk. And you're not stressed about getting through your stuff, you know? So, are there any stories, like any stories you, you know, looking back, you wish you would have swapped out or? Well, there's one or two in the appendix. The one thing I do, I had this good stuff in the appendix. So we, let's get to that in this podcast a little bit. There's a couple of verses in there about, um, uh, um, uh, that we'll get to that, that I think are like money is the answer to everything. And we talked about a little bit in the pre-podcast, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So a lot, all, all those verses that, that I thought were like Solomon's wisdom, those all got in the cutting room floor. I took them all out like the night before. I had a whole section on, you know, I basically was saying, here's the uh, the three sections of the book. We're going to talk about the professor's disillusionment, his attempts to find meaning and his conclusion. And in the middle there was going to be all his professor's wisdom. So when he says all these great sayings about, you know, there's a time for everything or there's a, actually, I wasn't going to cover that, um, but uh, money's the answer to everything. And a great, great sayings is wisdom. I left all that out because I knew, you know, I'll never get through all this stuff and I'll feel pressure to get through all this stuff. So that's some stuff I left out. Um, anyway, so that was, that was one thing. Um I think um, one of the things I think now as I look back on it, Greg, to kind of that I try to do, and I don't know if I do it well, is I try to really be clear that, you know, usually when I give these talks, clearly for me, Tim Keller is my largest influence spiritually. He's my largest influence spiritually in general, purposely. I mean, this is, has changed my life attending Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City and being there and listening to Tim Keller talk and then listening to him afterwards for years. So in, in when I'm giving the talk, I try to give attribution clearly and say, these are not, this is, this thought is not my thought. This comes from Tim Keller or in general, a lot of the thoughts here are from, and sometimes they even say, here's, here are the names of the sermons. Go get them. Yeah. Make sure I'm giving credit where credit is due. So no one says, wow, Jim, I can't believe you came up with this scheme to like, you know, say that there's a three way to live achievement causes and pleasure. Like that's straight from Tim Keller. That's not me. And and try to make sure I give credit where credit is due. I don't want to people say brilliant idea, Jim, and say, well, it's, the brilliance is Tim Keller, not not me. Well, and so. you do a great job. You do a great job with that. And the reality is, all of us stand on the shoulders of other people. Um, That's know, right. It's um, <laughs> I love the I love the quote. Originality is the art of forgetting your source. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't funny. even know who said that. <laughs> so it must be original with me. You that's can funny. Me. You that's can hilarious. Me that. Well, and Tim, look, Tim, Tim Keller, uh, he himself says his sources are C.S. Lewis and Jonathan. There was other sources too. But that reminds me of another quote. I was going to bring this up when I was talking about a cause-based life. And uh, I have this quote. I'm not sure. I could, I'm sure I could Google it in two seconds, find out who said it. But the saying is, life is for others. We all know that's true. Life is for others. What the others are here for, I have no idea. <laughs> so I, I just, I, I just love that. Life is for others. What the others are here for, I have no idea. I thought that was funny. I'm sure I could Google it in maybe two seconds, find out who said it. Uh, uh, so like a guy named W. H. Auden. That's his phrase. Yeah. W. W. H. Auden said that. W, that's what I, I don't even, tell me, is he a, what's he a poet? Oh, yeah, famous author, poet. He wrote uh, great work, Stop All the Clocks. Um, oh, says, fantastic. We are, we, Auden is fantastic. We are all here on earth to help others. What what on earth the others are here for, I don't know. <laughs> W.H. Auden. I was paraphrasing him. Thank you. I'll, I'll make that in my notes. W.H. Auden, it's... Uh, yeah, he's got a, a lot of it's great works. And I think he might have been a believer too. So 
Anyway, so that's one thing like this fight distinguishing between what's Keller and what's yours. And then one of the big points in the talk, as you may recall, is when I got to chapter nine and brought the gospel in. And that was one I was, a, and you and I talked about ahead of time. That was one I was a bit nervous about. That's not Keller. That was my kind of take on it, you know, and for better. I love that verse. Mention it, mention it here. Cause for yeah. people that didn't. Sure. So maybe if you missed the talk or whatever, but was trying to say like, what's the professor's conclusion? Cause he tries to find meaning in all these things and achievements and causes and then a pleasure-based life. And then he says, uh, and I said, now the exciting conclusion and, and, there, and there's in chapter 12, there's a verse where he says, this is the conclusion fear of God is keep his commandments. So I thought, aha, everyone's going to think that's what I'm going to go to. But I said, no, let's go to night chapter nine first. And chapter nine, verse seven says, go then eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart for God has already approved your works. And I tried to stress this, that that's pure gospel because it can't, that I cannot mean universal salvation. And I, not to reiterate what I talked about, but this is what we talked about in the talk, yeah. but for the believer where God had, you, you put your faith in Christ, God has approved your works. And then, and then to bring up the gospel, it's not your works. He's approving. It's Jesus works attributed to you. It's what you just mentioned, substitutionary atonement, right? The whole gospel is in Ecclesiastes chapter nine. God has approved your works there. So therefore your standing is complete. And, and I really want to dwell on this, Greg. I hope this came out, this befuddled Christian view of pleasure. Like, can I, can I have an ice cream cone? You know, that whole notion, like, is it okay to have fun once in a while? Right. And uh, is it okay to just enjoy life? And I think that the Christian confusion, I generally believe that there's confusion that most Christians say, I don't really have a good theory on that. I don't really know if it's okay. I'm just, I'm going to sneak it in anyway. I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to get the ice cream cone. I'm going to, uh, or whatever it is. And I was trying to lend some coherency to that to say, look, you can't sin. You can't, don't get drunk. Right. Um, you know, you, but, but it's really okay to enjoy life. And, and, and in fact, Solomon goes on in chapter nine, the next verse, he says, let your clothes be white all the time, not black in mourning, right? Let your clothes be white all the time. Let not oil be lacking in your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun. Now, here is one thing I thought of later that I wish I'd brought up. Solomon had like, what, 700 wives and 300 concubines, right? right? Maybe so. Maybe. So, so I mentioned at one point the talk looked like Solomon would tell you if you're if you're saying if only I had endless stream of lovers life would be complete things would be great and I said Solomon is saying oh no it wouldn't be it wouldn't be I've tried that and I wonder if if you know God took Solomon and said look Solomon you're going to write Ecclesiastes a thought experiment before you do that I'm going to make a I'm going to make an experiment with you I'm going to let you be the human being that goes to the end of the three paths you're going to go full-on cause-based life, full-on achievement-based life, full-on pleasure-based life, you're going to get to the end of those paths. And even in the pleasure, I skipped this too, Greg, in the pleasure-based life, he talks about, you know, we, we I think you, we men read this, we see the harem part and all the wives and the women, but he talks about drinking wine too. So like substances and su whatever, now he would say substance abuse, I just partied my heart out, right? Some would right. use a different language. But he's like, I had wine and delight, the delights of men. I had all this stuff. So they're like, I'm pushing substance abuse too. I'm going to like really push the limits of how, of pleasure in every hedonistic way I can. Um, and I think maybe, so maybe God says, I'm, I'm going to let you do that to report back to the world on what that, what it's like at the end of the path. Right. It's not because God's not, because Christians say, well, God let him have all these wives. How could that be right? And, and God's saying, it's not right. It's not just because he did it doesn't make it right. But it is this make a, a huge spiritual point. He had all that that you long for, that you know, uh, a lot of people long for. If only I could do these things, right? And, and they said, I had it, and it's not what you think. It would not do for you what you think it would do for you. And a part of the proof that I'd left out, Greg, is this verse nine, when he says, Enjoy life with the woman whom you love. It's singular. Yeah. It's not. Hey, you know, and if you could be like me and have a hundred wives, knock yourself out. There's none of that. It's almost like a refutation of his own life, right? He comes yeah. back and says, let me tell you what you should do. The one woman you love. And Proverbs talks about the wife of your youth, right? Yes. Yeah. Singular, singular, right? right. You carry like this, like, you know what you should do? <laughs> Don't do what I did. 
lo- enjoy life with the woman whom you love, with your spouse, all the days of your life. That's your reward. And they, and um, and I kind of wish I dwelled on that a little more, but um, because it it really is a kind of repudiation of his own um lifestyle with his harems and and all the rest. So that's good. That's good. Does it ever bother you? Because sometimes it's hard for me to reconcile in my mind how, you know, when Solomon was it granted one wish and he asked God for wisdom. Yeah. And God gives him wisdom. And then yet his whole life is like this kind of like goes off the tr- train tracks and is as um it, it's like i just for years i was like if he's so wise how could he stray so far right do you think it's because god gave him worldly wisdom but not necessarily spiritual wisdom no i think it's i th- i i never thought of the distinction greg i don't know maybe maybe you're right i think god says i'm going to give you wisdom and i'm going to give you these experiences and you're going to be able to reflect back on how 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 great those were and were do we were you able to find meaning in life in those ways because um well like because you, know, you, you you did you did a great job bringing out i love that you brought this out the whole idea of being under the sun yeah and how well, under, 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 under when you're under the sun there's a there's a way there's a way that seems wise to a man right but right. the proverb says there's a way that seems wise to a man and in the end it leads to death. Right. But then but then in the book of Ecclesiastes, he's able to go above the clouds. Right. And that's where I kind of see is there two there's worldly wisdom and there's earthly wisdom, and then there's godly wisdom. Oh, in that sense, yeah. You know, well, maybe that's a way to say he did have it all because there's times he's using godly wisdom where he says, look, obey God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. And then he's below the clouds, you know, saying you're just like animals and there's no point and we all die and death ruins everything. And, you know, so, you know, that's maybe your earthly wisdom. Right. So what else uh what um, else stood out to you? Well, a little bit like you when you were saying that uh you know the you when you were talking about Psalm 119, you say, Oh, what a great thought someone said. The first verse is symmetry of the last verse. I think during ours, and I I, I know that for the sake of time, some of the QA uh was edited out, so I'm not sure it'll make the podcast post. But during the during the QA, one of the commenters said, um, he made a really great point. I had said during the course of the talk that uh one of the things that uh solomon concludes is that uh, everything's meaningless because of death uh because death ends everything so he says look i can achieve all this stuff but i gotta hand i can hand it off to someone else who's gonna inherit it and they might be a fool so death renders a lot of his life meaningless but uh uh it was tim miller actually who, who uh in our bible study who chimed in and said it's actually two things that he talks about and the point is that you don't control either of them. One is death that you have no control over. And the other one is time that you have no control over. And that's the point of that long passage at the beginning of chapter three, mm. where it was made into a folk song to everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. You know, uh, it's chapter three, verse, uh, starts at verse one. There's an appointed time for everything. And there's a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted and so on and so on. And the point was, you don't control death. You can be as wise as you want. You don't control death, and you don't control time. It's out of your control, and that's what gives him the wisdom. And as soon as, of course, as soon as he said it, like just like you, I, when you the Psalm one nineteen, yeah, first and last verse that you were talking about in, our, in the last podcast. Why didn't I, I think of that? Oh, it was such a great, it's so great. <laughs> but that's that, but that's the way the Lord works. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. And I think that's one of the actual beauties of getting. That's why God wants Christians to gather together in fellowship, right? There are things right. That, you'll that, see. that is one of the nice things about the allowing for other people, like the the a community of minds. That's right. You know, because you you do, um, yeah. I, I mean, even sometimes when you and I are talking, like we'll read a one of us will make a comment and be like, "Oh, I never thought of that. I never saw it that." Yeah. Way. You know, and that those are those are awesome. 
time. So that, so yeah, you, you, uh, um, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a good moment. And I, and I think that's a, that's actually a really great thing about it. So, um, so there were a couple other things. There was, like I said, the professor's wisdom that ended up on the cutting room floor. But I think, I think we talked about this a little bit, um, during the, uh, pre podcast that the, the verse that has money's the answer to everything and how hard people have stumbled on that verse. And I think I mentioned, I think we talked about this in the pre podcast, Greg, that a lot of the commentaries I read skip that verse entirely. They don't know what to make of it. It's, and it's oh. odd. They're talking about the few verses before and they have all these commentary. They skip that verse and they go right to the next one. Like I, there's if they're throwing up their hands and no. how, could, how could he say, how could he say money's the answer? What does it mean that he says money's the answer to everything? And for, our listeners, it's it's chapter 10, verse 19. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. You think, how does the Bible say money's the answer to everything? How could that be? And the answer is the answer, first of all, is that he cannot possibly mean that he really thinks money is the answer because he's just talked about how achievement is not fulfilling. And he tried that and it didn't work. So he can't mean that, but he, he very, very quickly, all the verses around are talking about bad leadership and bad kingdoms and how, uh, so what he's saying is, you know, these types of bad leaders, their kingdoms fall apart and they're the ones who are drinking wine and eating their meals and enjoyment and just say money's the answer to everything. They're living, they're running their kingdom for money. So it's just another example of bad leadership. That was one commentary that made that clear. And I, then the light bulb went off and said, oh yeah, of course, that's the obvious meaning. So yeah. Mm. Um, Yeah, that was that was one thing, and then the other um, the other uh, verses are really great, and you know, it, it's just like when you're doing the Psalms. There's so many great ones, like Psalm 139. You wish you could dwell on them, but there's the famous passage in Ecclesiastes: two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. This is chapter four, verse nine. Yeah, the cord of three strands. Exactly, it's so great, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and what is? And you tell me, what does it mean, Greg? Well, I mean, the cord of three strands is the the third strand is is God. It's Jesus. It's right. it's uh, the key to a strong marriage. Um, is to put um, is let letting uh, letting Jesus be that third strand, and three strands tied together make a strong rope. Right, right, and so that the whole pastor is talking about two, 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 and the last one says a cord of three strands, and you're right. But the Lord's there in the in that relationship. It just changes the whole, makes it so strong and changes it. So that's just such a great verse. You yeah. just really you don't you want to you just don't want to leave it out, right? Um, but in the interest of time, that was one. And then uh, there's another one in chapter nine, verse eleven, that says, uh, "I have seen something else under the sun." Again, this is under the sun thinking, right? The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Mm. And that notion of like randomness of life, it's like uh, it doesn't always work out fairly the way you think it's going to work out. You know, the race is not to the swift. The battle is not always to the strong. And it's uh, it's what we talked about with wisdom literature. You know, Proverbs says this is the way generally it should work. You do these you live according to Christian principles, biblical, godly principles. Life turns out well. And Ecclesiastes and Job come along and say, well, not always. There's a lot of randomness randomness of life, too. And um, I know, and, and then, uh, Greg, I was going to say, I, I remember quoting this once to uh, someone, a, a young businessman. And he said, uh, I said, like, there's so much randomness in life. And he said, his his response was, "Yeah, but I'd like to see the percentages." <laughs> but you know, if you if you work hard, you do these things, make the right moves, chances are, life will turn out well. And and maybe there's some wisdom in his response because yeah, you know that you you should try to do the right thing in life and work hard with integrity and all those other principles of living. And generally speaking, yes, there is randomness in life, but generally speaking life does go better so um yeah and then anyway. you, missed, you didn't talk about uh ecclesiastes 11 verse 1 cast your bread upon the waters yes you'll find it after many days isn't that a that's a song that goes like that cast your bread upon the waters 
Um, I'm not sure. How, it, you know, it was that speaking of generosity. Give your material I, things to the needy. I don't know. Cast your bread upon the waters. The song ties that together with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Who did that song? It's an old Christian kind of folk song. Um, one of our listeners will know and they'll let us know. Um, but uh, no, I missed that verse, Greg. I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure I even know what it means. Cast your bread on the surface of the waters. You will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight. For you do not know what misfortune will occur upon the earth. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain on the earth. And whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. It lies. Yeah, that's an that's an that's that's one of those. That almost sounds like a Stephen Wright, like like <laughs> uh, saying, if a tree falls to the south or the north, wherever it falls, there it lies. There it that lies. reminds me of Stephen Wright, where he says, "Man." If your if your car keys accidentally fall into a river of molten lava, let them go because well, man, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, wisdom, wisdom. Uh, uh, that's that's there's a, yes. There was an old movie I remember where the catchphrase was "Wherever you go, we always remember wherever you go, there you are." There you are. Yeah. It's called, yes, it's a tautology. It's a it's self evident. Um, so some of the commentators I'm looking at think that 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 cast your bread upon the waters is all about generosity. It's giving your material things to the needy in a way that might seem wasteful. Wasteful is like throwing your bread upon the waters, but then you'll be rewarded. So it's like do something now for a reward that cannot be immediately seen. Yeah, that's good. You'll but, cast your bread in the water. But you, but, you brought this, but, you, but you did bring this out, like that towards these chapters, they are, they're almost like Proverbs. Right. It's wisdom literature. Here's some thoughts I have on how to live and what, right, what life is about. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, and the, and the, right, like a part of this, there's a, this, and this kind of ties in with the way I was talking about pleasure, how it's okay to have pleasure and enjoy, just enjoy life. There's a phrase he kept, he mentions, like it comes up three times. I saw there's nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. It's almost the same exact phraseology. It comes up in chapter five, verse 18, chapter three, 22, and then chapter two, verse 24. And the key for that thought was it's in chapter two it says a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil like enjoy your work this too i see is from the hand of god for without him who can eat or find enjoyment and the point of it is you have to be with him first if you're with him if you're in him if you're saved if you're a believer if you're in christ then you can find happiness in these things because you're not looking for them to form the base of your identity you're free from that and you can actually enjoy them but that i thought that was actually great verses but they're redundant with a thought i was already talking about from chapter nine verse seven so i kind of there was no point to say it again i just kind of left it out yeah is that the last thing you would change or well, yeah i think so and then the, um want to talk about song of solomon for a minute yeah i thought i i thought you did a great job uh five just, minutes it, it, yeah expressing the different views of it i thought that was very interesting and how they're very adamant very strong feelings against the uh, people that believe different than them that's right that's right and big names i didn't mention this but john MacArthur is one is literal literalville no absolutely not allegorical oh, it's just literal it's just all it's just a lover and Really? No, well, and I think there I think there are people who say if I don't, I will dilute scripture somehow. There really it seems like that's the backdrop of you know but there's for, so much there's so much in the old testament that there's all kinds of allegories about Israel. Oh yeah. And and the, I think I mean find the verse now, uh, where the Bible itself, um, New Testament writers refer to a, the old testament in allegorical terms. Mm. Uh, Galatians. This is this is the one I was thinking of. In Galatians four, Paul is talking. Galatians four twenty four. Um, he's talking about um, freedom and Christian liberty and like being the law versus grace. 
And uh, he talks about Abraham had two, verse 22, Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. And then verse 23, the, the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh and the son of the free woman according to the promise. So he's talking about, you know, grace versus works. Chapter two, verse 24, this is Paul writing. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in, A in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. We don't have to talk about it anymore, but he's clearly reading that Old Testament passage allegorically. He says so. <laughs> it's not like it's wrong to do that. You know, you right. do have to interpret scripture. You don't get it too far, but it really felt like almost a, a hostility from the literal people towards the allegorical point of view, like, oh, no, no. oh, no, don't go there. Not not one minute. So, um, do you are you do you feel solidly where you stand on this? I've always thought it was allegorical. I thought the whole beauty of it is allegorical. I've heard. I thought the whole point of like, why is there a love story in the middle of the Bible? And yeah. they, the literal people say, well, it's just there to say romance is okay and sex is okay. It's like a little lesson for us all. Okay, that's nice, but it's it's such a gushy love poem. Yeah. Oh, and you talked about how Psalm one fifty one was not canon people like for early on song of songs supposedly from very early on so people said oh that's inspired scripture like really yeah i mean this is long before christianity this is in the jewish supposedly they they easily right away that's that's inspired because they thought it was this is really allegorically about god's love for his people yeah and it is, it's just now we say his people are really christ the church christ's bride right yeah but they always thought that way, like this is God gushing over us, and that's why we gush over him, because for the whole Bible, soup to nuts, start to finish, is meant to be a love story. I had you, and I lost you, and I'll go to any lengths to get you back. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that, I, I've kind of come down to the allegorical side. I was, I was actually surprised to see people strongly against reading it that way. I thought, Oops, I I, okay, well. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, that's the way I feel too. I mean, and it fits with the rest of Scripture. It fits with kind of the overall theme of the Bible that it, it the Bible is a love story from right. it's God's love for us and how we're the ones who stray away from Him. And um, so, well, look at Hosea. Look at the whole book of Hosea, right? Where the God tells the prophet, "I want you to marry a prostitute." Mm -hmm. The whole thing is an allegorical relationship to represent. God's, you know, love for his people and how his people have gone astray and uh and yet God still comes after them and loves them. Loves loves them. Yeah. So it's written uh, by Solomon and he's Solomon loved all these different women, but here he's writing about one woman. Right. 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 Which oh, I wonder, so, if that, wonder if that ties into that verse you mentioned earlier that you know Right. Hey, oh, the one the one the I lost. One, the one that you really love. Maybe. Right. Um, be a be a one woman man kind of thing. Yeah, that's um, right. And the I, the inverse is true. Be a one guy gal, I guess, or however you'd say it. Be a one man woman. Right. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Anything else about song? You well, yeah. They, they, I do. I did find it interesting. I, I read one interpretation how they tried to. It's all written in first person. My lover is this. My lover is that. And there's some headings that kind of give you the idea of who's saying what and when. But the notion of who's saying what and why, there were different interpretations of that. And the one I read in, in the class was one commentator that said, okay, this is the way the pattern, girl meets boy, girl separated from boy, girl meets king, king likes girl, girl resists king, girl reunited with boy. That's just one interpretation. There were others that read it differently, like what the point is. So um, that one made a lot of sense to me when I went back and read it, but there's there's different, thought, different points of view on that. So um Mm. I'm not sure what there is to, be, is to be gained by going down that rabbit hole. I thought that's one way to look at it that makes sense, but you know, there's yeah. not much to debate that. Well, Jim, I think this has been good. I we've uh, is there any anything else you want to say about Ecclesiastes or Song of Solomon? I think there's um there's one thought, but I think uh, you can probably cut this out later in in uh, post and edit this out. Uh, but but I'll, I'll tell you. But I, I think you would probably edit this out. Um, 
We were talking about that idea of money is the answer to everything. I've often, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, Greg, but when I went to New York and worked there, uh, and I thought about telling this story when we were there, but I, I cut this out too. Um, you know, my dad worked in a factory and never, I don't think he ever made more than twenty, twenty three, two thousand dollars $2,000 a year, something like that. And when I went to New York and the amounts of money, one of the first deals I did as a lawyer, did I, did I tell you this? The guy, we, he remember. made a, we, he, um, we sold his business. It was a mutual fund business. He made $125 million personally, and he bought the the biggest the most expensive apartment in Manhattan at the time, um, I think it was fifty million dollars. Maybe maybe it was like a hundred million dollars. I don't remember. It was like it was such an astronomical amount of money, and I just never seen money. People think you know. My parents wanted to make sure I had a job that had health benefits. You know, make sure you get right. a job with benefits because that's when you were flipping burgers in high school. You didn't have benefits, so it's important when you go to college you get a job with benefits. And these are people making hundreds of millions of dollars and and then then the thought greg was not just the not just the personal wealth of individuals because that was staggering to begin with but the sheer size of the money when you start dealing with the capital markets so you start dealing with helping companies access capital you know hundreds of millions of dollars at a time and and then i realized here's my big thought on and this was actually my first thought when I read money's the answer to everything. Um, the money, the money is so enormous. It's almost an entity unto itself. The money is almost like a living and breathing entity that oh. is always, always hungry and seeking return. And people, governments try to grab it and, and say, well, I'd like some of that. And I'm going to divert it to this purpose. And the money says, nope, we're going to go over here. So if the Chinese government, for example, clamps down on Hong Kong and says, no, we don't like this. We want to take the, the, all the money. will say, okay, we're going to go to Singapore. And the money will just move. The money is, the money is like as, as cold and, and brutal as outer space and as living and breathing as a newborn baby. And uh. hungry. It is... Ne it never sleeps. You know, that phrase from the movie Wall Street, money never sleeps. Yeah. Money is always on the lookout. And there's a sense in which it's always seeking a productive return. So the 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 vast quantity of money, not the, the few pennies you and I get to take home as a paycheck, but the vast quantity of money is roaming the surface of the earth, like as if the earth is formless and void, and the money is always, always circling the globe, looking for a productive use to cultivate creation and make it more productive. Wow. If there's a solar panel plant in the Philippines, it'll find it. And if there's a lithium mine in uh, Iceland, it'll or Greenland, it'll find it and fund those. They're constantly seeking the, the productive, productive, productive. And somebody says, you know, you ought to do do this other cause over here. Nope, well, the money will. Yep, we'll do that for a while, but then move over here. And the the money is a living and breathing entity in a way that I never expected, and that was. That was my New York experience. So you can cut all that out from the talk, Greg. Uh, that just... is, no, that's very interesting. And that makes me want to, uh, we should talk sometime about whether or not there'll be money in heaven. Well, yeah, interesting. Can you, can you think... have, can you have, can you have heaven without money or currency or, you know? Well, you could say money, the money itself isn't bad. It's the love of money. It's the abuse of money. It's the greed. Right, but as a medium of exchange, it's an efficient medium of exchange. So you kind of need all that. And if you say, if you're in a world where everyone is completely other centered, I'm not hoarding, I'm not greedy, I'm not worried about my next my next day or my next meal. So I think there can be absolutely be money in heaven. It just um, it's uh, but it wouldn't be viewed the same. It wouldn't have the same significance. It wouldn't have the same distortions it has here. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.